Dr. Carter G. Woodson, Miseducation of the Negro. Dr. Woodson said that Harvard University taught him to hate himself and that it took him nearly 20 years to undo the menticide that America's finest institution put in him. He started Negro History Week because he saw that what black people knew themselves to have been in history had a direct impact on how they see themselves today. We got a whole lot of religion, but we got almost no understanding of who we are as a race of people. And as the Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey said, whose pitch I want to get to now. Flip it up. Let's flip this on up. All right. A people without knowledge of their history is like a tree without roots you cannot stand. The fact that you're Christian means nothing because when you go to college, there are going to be white Christians and Arab Christians and East Indian Christians, but they're going to know who they are. The fact you're Muslim means nothing because there are going to be Asian Muslims and Arab Muslims and white Muslims, but the difference is they know who they are and you don't. Religion cannot replace racial culture. Islam is 1,500 years old. Christianity is 2,000 years old. We are more than 2 million years old. Why would you give up that degree of history for religion? You don't have to give up your religion, but you make sure you simply know who you are first. The Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey right here, greatest black leader of the 20th century, leader of the largest black movement in modern history, the Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Communities League, for which I am a former minister of education. Marcus Garvey was born August the 17th, 1887, St. Anne's Bay, Jamaica, where I was a couple weeks ago. The Jamaican government recently made Marcus Garvey's childhood home a historic monument, and I was keynote speaker at the University of the West Indies in Jamaica for National Heroes Month. It was this man who gave us the red, black, and green flag. It was this man who brought forth 15 million Africans from all across the world together under the banner of the red, black, and green flag. We was light-skinned, dark-skinned, educated, uneducated, African, Asiatic, Caribbean, black, American, whatever you want to call yourself. And Marcus Garvey made us all stand up at one time and say we are Africans. Never before have you had that. Malcolm X's father comes from his organization. In fact, Malcolm X's father was murdered during work for the Garvey movement. His mother used to write articles for the Garvey paper. Minister Louis Farrakhan's family were Garveyites. The founders of the Rastafari were Garveyites. Every modern movement today owes a debt to Mr. Garvey for laying the foundation for how to build a mass movement. He said, without confidence in yourself, you are twice defeated in the race of life. With confidence, you have won even before you have started. Y'all better remember that as y'all prepare for college. Without confidence in yourself, you are twice defeated in the race of life. With confidence, you have won even before you have started. These are some of Marcus Garvey's political descendants. They are Pan-Africanists. Marcus Garvey was the father of modern Pan-Africanism. He was not the first Pan-Africanist. He was simply the greatest. Pan-Africanism goes all the way back more than 200 years. Most people look at the Haitian Revolution as the beginning of Pan-Africanism when the San Domingo a group of enslaved Africans rose up against French slavery and oppression and won a war which in 1804 culminated in the forming of the first independent black nation on this side of the world, Haiti. To Sattler Overture, Bookman Dada, a voodoo priest who actually gave the call to arms for the Haitian Revolution. And of course, the first emperor of Haiti, Jean-Jacques Dessalines, was some of the first Pan-Africans. And that's the 1700s. Pan-Africanism is older than any other political ideology that we have. And it's going to be your task to rediscover Pan-Africanism as the solution to the problems that affect black people in America. As long as black folk in America keep trying to solve our problems as an isolated group of 40 million descendants of ex-slaves, we will get nowhere. You must see yourself as a member of a global race. White supremacy is global. It is everywhere at all times. And if we are going to come out from under it, then our program will also be global. The only thing that can destroy white supremacy is pan-African nationalism. Here you have Julius Nyeri who led Tanzania a nation in Southeast Africa to independence. 
from colonialism. What does that mean? Colonialism means that when slavery ended here in 1865, white folk went to Africa and made our brothers and sisters on the continent slaves in their own country. So while we was over here celebrating the 13th Amendment, they were enslaved in Africa. We got a bad habit of celebrating too quickly. Like we celebrate Obama. For what? For what? You don't let television, you don't let Negro leaders dictate to you how you define success. Have your own definition for success. And a black person being chosen by white supremacy to carry out its agenda is not success. And if we teach that to our babies, we give them permission to be traitors to their race by celebrating traitors to the race. Over here, Kwame Nkrumah, who came to Philadelphia, a member of the Philadelphia UNIA, as was I, went back to Ghana in 1957 and led Ghana to become the first independent nation in Africa after colonialism, which means it was the first nation to kick white people out who had no right to be there in the first place. Over here, you have Nanam Ezekiel, who also came to Philadelphia and studied like Kwame Nkrumah at Lincoln University and then went back and led Nigeria to its independence. I had the opportunity to visit with his son, Chief Ezekiel Way. When I was in Nigeria back in 2005, he gave me a plaque with his father's face on it that hangs in my home. And Jomo Kenyatta, who particip excuse me, participated in the independence movement of Kenya. Pan-Africanism. In fact, when Kwame Nkrumah led Ghana to its independence, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was present in the African country of Ghana to help celebrate the independence of Ghana. No, I wouldn't call him a Pan-Africanist, but he definitely had enough sense to know that he was an African, and as African goes, so do the rest of us. And then you have Malcolm X, a child of the Garvey movement, who would fall into disarray as a youth after his mother went through some psychological issues as a result of suffering from the stress of racism. And as a psychologist, I can tell you every problem black folk got, especially mental illness, can all be traced to the stress of racism. Malcolm X would join the Nation of Islam under Elijah Muhammad, a former member of the Garvey movement, when his name was Elijah Poole. Okay, and then of course he would leave the Nation of Islam and go back to Garveyism, go back to Pan-Africanism. Why was Malcolm murdered? Because Malcolm was about to take the plight of black folk to the United Nations. Forget civil rights, he said human rights. We're not American citizens, so what are we fighting for civil rights for? We are a nation in exile. So let us fight as a nation in exile. Two weeks before Malcolm was murdered, he met with Coretta Scott King, Dr. King's wife. Dr. King was in jail. They agreed to disagree. Malcolm and Martin was going to come together under one movement. And for the first time in black history, you were going to have two significant black leaders who were willing to put their ego to the side for the benefit of the race. J. Edgar Hoover, director of the FBI, found out that Malcolm and King was coming together. And Malcolm was dead in two weeks after he met with Coretta Scott King. Dr. King was assassinated three years later because not only did he speak out on the war, in Vietnam, but more importantly, he was about to launch a poor people's campaign where he was going to take millions of Americans of all races and classes to the mall in Washington, D.C., the heart of American power and government, and they were going to erect a tent city. Poor people were going to move into D.C. until they all left with jobs and food. That was revolution. That's why Dr. King was murdered. Killed by the Italian Mafia on the order of the FBI and CIA with help of the Ku Klux Klan. There's a book that you need to read called An Act of State. An Act of State. Written by Dr. King's family's attorney, William Pepper, a white man who sued the United States government for their involvement and complicity in Dr. King's assassination. And they won the case. And they won the case. So why is it when I was in Memphis, Tennessee a few weeks ago at the National Civil Rights Museum, which is simply the hotel where Dr. King was murdered, converted into a hotel, they're still teaching that James Earl Ray killed Dr. King when it had been proven in court that he had nothing to do with the murder. It's because miseducation is the greatest weapon in psychological extermination. My ancestor Frederick Douglass said it becomes impossible to educate a man 
and still expect him to be a slave. And all of you sitting here are going to have to do what? After college and before college, re-educate yourself. Getting a four-year education at a white college ain't helping black people. you got to re-educate yourself. What I've learned to help black folk, I did not get it at none of my three institutions. I had to study Amos Wilson, a black psychologist. I had to study Bobby Wright, the black psychologist. I had to study Nine Akbar, Wade Nobles, Thomas Parham. I had to study Francis Fanon and Dr. Francis Cress Wilson. I had to study Kamal Cambone. I had to study Marimba Ani and any other sociologist because sociology is the study of group psychology, the study of individuals, criminology, the study of criminal behavior. There's no way I'm going to be able to help black folk just with what white folk taught. Now, I can use some of the foundations of what they give me to create my own approach to solve my people's problem, but I can't use Sigmund Freud to help black folk because Sigmund Freud wasn't concerned with black folk. So whatever it is you want to be in life, you've got to get a re-education. All of you should be de developing a bookshelf at home right now. Outside of your school books, you should be reading your own books. 243 years, black folks were forced to work for free in America. Sun up to sun down. Many people died simply by being overworked. The number one cause of death was slave children. And the antebellum South was being deprived of the love of their mothers and fathers who were out working while they sat in houses with the old folk, emotionally neglected. Many black children today are emotionally neglected. I'm fighting a war right now that's putting black boys in special education when it ain't nothing wrong with them. Learning disability diagnosis that they don't have, ADHD diagnosis that they don't have, conduct disorder diagnosis that they don't have, psychiatric prescriptions for Ritalin, Risperdal, and Depakote, and Cyclertin, Adderall, and Paxil, Concerta, Zoloft. The same illegal drugs that they send black men to jail for every day, they're giving derivatives of it to black boys, and we sitting by like a community acting like it's okay. The greatest success of slavery is teaching the slave to participate in his own extermination. We the number one weapon of white supremacy, the mind of the Negro. And you got to make sure you come out of college without being a Negro because the whole purpose of college, HBCU or white one, is to turn you into a Negro. Some of you don't know this, but many of America's presidents were of African descent. Thomas Jefferson had a black grandfather. George Washington had a black grandfather. Abraham Lincoln had a black grandfather. Calvin Coolidge, who was president at the time of Marcus Garvey's incarceration was of African ancestry. This is President William McKinley with a picture of his black grandfather. Barack Obama was not the first biracial president. He was the seventh. He's the first one who couldn't hide the fact that he had Africans in his family tree. You read Obama books instead of worshiping him on TV. What did Obama tell you in his books? I didn't choose to be black. I was made to be black. If he could have passed, he could. I don't know who told black people that Barack Obama is proud to be an African. I've seen no proof of it yet. Anytime you get on national television and call yourself a mutt, what is a mutt? A mutt is a dog that is mixed with a high breed stock and a low breed stock. So when Obama called himself a mutt, who exactly was he was referring to as a low breed stock? You. He would have rather been, been born pure white man. That doesn't mean he's not an African. Because all black folk, whether they got one white parent, a white mother or a white dad, if you got one parent who's an African, you're still an African. So we don't divide our people up into groups. We don't practice eugenics within our race. A black brother with a white mother or a black sister with a white dad, that ain't her fault. We're not responsible for how we got here. An African is an African. But I don't consider Barack Obama psychologically an African because he's not loyal to his race. Just like I would reject you if you're not loyal to your race. Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas is blue, black, purple. But I do not consider him to be an African because he's not loyal to his race. And then he got a nerve to be married to George Bush's cousin. No. Mm -hmm. He married Luck Rush Limbaugh, the most racist radio personality in America. He married him in his house because Clarence Thomas happens to be an ordained minister at the same time. In fact, you're going to find that many of our popular ministers are some of the worst self-hating Negroes you could ever have around. Anybody know the actor Taraja P. Henson? Played and I can do bad all by myself. This is her grandfather, Matthew P. Henson, the first human being to stand at the North Pole. North Pole is the coldest place on Earth. 
we set out with a group of Europeans and other folk to set out as an explorer to be the first person to stand at the North Pole. He was the first one to get there. The others didn't make it.